determination, and I thought that's something that would be of great relevance to you today. Essentially, also it needs to be said that self-determination is supposed to have been the route through which people who are oppressed gain their freedom. And that's something that goes back to the French and American revolutions. It goes back to the way in which Latin America was decolonized. It goes back, of course, to the decolonization movement that's affected all of us when we, when, when, the, when 52, when the original 51 countries that signed the UN Charter became the 194 countries we have today. So self-determination has been a very powerful concept throughout history. But self-determination has been very difficult to interpret. So for instance, in 1914, when American President Woodrow Wilson said that it's for every people to make their own determination. No nation can ignore the rights of oppressed peoples. And he makes this statement at the time, and he's referring, of course, to Europe. And he's referring to Europe after World War I. He's referring to the breakup of the various empires in Europe. The difficulty becomes who decides, who gets to ask that question, and who gets to vote in that particular question. And of course, when it came to UN decolonization of countries like Pakistan, India, and various countries in Asia and Africa, the fundamental premise became that you had to respect the colonial boundaries that were drawn. And those colonial boundaries that were drawn became national frontiers. You, of course, know better than I do the history of the separation of India and Pakistan. But for me, one of the key documents in that particular aspect, and something I've written quite recently about, is on the question of autonomy in Pakistan. Looking back at the 1940 resolution and looking at the promises that were made, three of which are very distinctly, three of the five promises are very distinctly about autonomy, very distinctly about the rights of peoples in Pakistan, such as the Sindhis, such as the Baluchis, such as the Pakhtuns, and even the Bengalis at that time. And I think that's a crucial document to bear in mind. And in terms of self-determination itself, you can think very easily of this notion that self-determination is an answer to oppressed peoples. The fact is, in public international law, there are great restrictions on self-determination. So, the, the right to self-determination is framed as Article 1 of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. And as a victim of the Indian education system, I can quote it to you. It says something like, all peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of this right, they freely determine their political status and decide on their economic, social, and cultural engagements. The key is the first, the first phrase. All peoples have a right to self-determination. The next question becomes, well, who are the people? If you look at international law, you will find that there's support for at least three groups for being peoples. First and foremost, top of the list, would be Palestinians. Even the Israelis recognize the Palestinians as people. Second would be probably the Tibetans, where everyone except China recognizes, by and large, the Tibetans as a people. And the third would probably be the Kurds, where you have a number of states, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, reluctant to recognize the Kurds as a people. The difficulty becomes, even with these three, what you would call in international law, open and shut cases of self-determination, we don't have states of Palestine, Kurdistan, or Tibet. The reason for that is not legal, the reason for that is politics. The reason for that is the extent to which these communities have been able to articulate their own rights as a nation and be able to gain that particular right in constitutional law. So the challenge then becomes for, for, for nations like the Sindhis, for nations like the Baluchis, how do you go about, in an international legal scenario, articulating a right for self-determination? And the answer is it's really hard, but it's not a closed door. When the UN was formed, India, for instance, argued that self-determination is like a, it's like a disposable razor blade. You use it once, you throw it away. So India said, of course we believe in self-determination. That's how we got independence from the British. But Kashmir can't have self-determination because that's already been used. That particular right has been exhausted. Now that goes against the fundamental principle of what self-determination is. If self-determination is a remedy to oppression, whenever oppression exists, self-determination ought to be today. The difficulty with it is, again, the how question. How do you get there? If you're saying, on the one hand, the law is very clear, then why is it that the law can't be put into practice? So you, one of the things I would encourage you to do is to look at the recent cases of self-determination that have arisen. In Timor-Leste, self-determination was achieved through plebiscite. South Sudan is the most recent one. 
Of course, there, there, there are issues now as to what is happening on the ground with Islamic State and what is going to be and possibly a new map of the Middle East. But there are these questions that are being asked at the moment. And it's, 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 on the one hand, it's very close that self-determination is not available to anyone other than peoples. You would, be, you would find it very difficult to define as peoples in the way in which the UN would classify it. But you need to find other ways and means to articulate the case. Sometimes a good idea is not just a good idea that comes to fruition at a particular time. Sometimes a good idea needs to wait for a good time. In the meantime, there are lots of things that can be done. Every single human rights violation should be documented. Every single extrajudicial killing should be documented. Every single articulation for autonomy should be framed. Various different discussions should be instigated on what that Lahore resolution was meant to be at the foundation of the Pakistani state. And of course, the international pressure has to be kept up to highlight the plight that your fellow countrymen face. Thank you very much.